In this InspiredInsider.com interview, we talk with Perry Marshall. He's helped hundreds of thousands of advertisers save billions of dollars in AdWords. He's a mastered storyteller. He goes into how he tells stories. He also talks about his big why, what drove him early on was eating bologna sandwiches, and then now also that and much more coming up right now. Testing, testing, just talk on your end for a second. Welcome to the Pleasure Dome. <laughs> You've come to the right place. That's a better intro than mine. Um, so, Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today we have one of the legends, Perry Marshall. He's one of the legends of copywriting, direct response marketing, and much more if you read up on him. Entrepreneur Magazine says Perry Marshall is the number one author and world's most quoted consultant on Google Advertising. He's helped over 100,000 advertisers save billions of dollars in AdWords. He's one of the world's most expensive and sought after marketing consultants, so get your notepads out now. Prior to his consulting career, he helped grow a tech tech company from 200,000 to 4 million in sales in just four years. And that firm was sold to a public company in 2001 for $18 million. His works include, there's so many to list, but I just included two, The Ultimate Guide to Google AdWords and 8020 Sales and Marketing and many more. Perry, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. It's really great to be here and you have a very distinguished audience and uh, I'm glad to be having this conversation. Uh, it'll be fun. I promise it'll be fun today. So. Thank you. And, um, you know, I'm excited to hear your big lessons learned, your mistakes, what worked, what didn't work. Um, before we get into it, I always like to include a fun fact. And when we were talking, you said a fun fact is you, in the other room, you designed a stereo. Tell me about that and how much, if you bought it retail, how much would it cost? Well, if um, my original fetish uh, when I was a teenager was stereo equipment. And since I was too poor to buy what I want, I had to build it. And it, it turned in, uh, it ended up being becoming an electrical engineer and uh, designing speakers uh, as a career. I designed the speakers in the 95 uh Ford Probe and the 95 Acura Vigor and Jeep, Jeep Cherokee and some some different vehicles, but yeah, I'm like I'm I'm a serious music addict, and uh, so yeah, I, I got a speaker system in the next room, and if you bought it at a store, it probably cost you thirty or forty thousand dollars. Wow. Um, I, I decided a long time ago I don't want to be in the audio business. Uh, better is just a hobby. But, um, and that's where I write my copy. It's like a big giant set of headphones, you know, that so are six feet tall. What are you listening to at the time? What do you listen to when you're, you're listening um, on the headphones? I listen to a lot of jazz and I listen to a lot of progressive rock, uh, sometimes borders on heavy metal. Hmm. Uh, I don't, I don't like the screamo stuff at all, but if it's just a, a couple notches below that, like really intense, I, I write my best copy when it's like, just banging, pounding. Um, so, <laughs> so great. that that some people have to write in complete silence, and I want like that's I the just opposite. Want... Yeah. Um, so. so, well, maybe you'll blast some at the end of this interview. Um, so, <laughs> but it won't sound good. That's the problem. Give us a it'll, taste. Of you it. know, it'll come through this cheesy microphone. Got that's, it. Got that's it. the only problem. So, Perry, I want to hear about what shaped you early on, but I have to ask first. You know, you majored in, in engineering, mm -hmm. you know, and then you went from engineering to a sales job. Tell right. me about that. Was there any, you know, were you looking at engineering jobs? How did you transition to a sales position? Well, I got laid off um, from designing speakers, actually. And I could have moved to another city and gotten another uh, acoustics job, but I didn't want to move out of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And my wife was three months pregnant with our first kid and it was like, and the pressure's on and she's planning on quitting her legal secretary job when the kid gets born. So, you know, okay, we got a short runway here, got to do something. And, you know, I had already been uh, an MLM distributor. That was actually my, you know, crash course in sales. And, mm -hmm. and actually 
that all by itself didn't really make me very good at sales, but it did clean me up a lot, and I looked good, and I... Well, you know, like, okay, so I think MLM is a huge rite of passage for lots of people, right? Probably half of all the entrepreneurs I ever meet, like, they've they've done some time uh, doing that. And, uh, you know, and, and so if... If you're willing to do what they tell you to do, then your upline will they'll come and they'll help you do meetings and they'll they'll give you advice and they'll talk to you for hours on the phone and 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 they'll make you wear a, a black or blue suit with a white shirt and a red tie, you know, and make you look presentable and respectable and you'll go out and you'll give presentations and you know, somehow or another you will get polished up. Okay. Now they teach you a lot of bad habits. Okay. They teach you a lot of good habits. It's like this really, really mixed bag of mm -hmm. like horrible dysfunction combined with some really great virtuous things. And it's all kind of, you know, twisted together. Okay. But like, so that's where I was. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and like, it wasn't very hard to get hired for a sales job. Like, well, you know, this, you know, he's an engineer, but, you know, he presents pretty well and seems to be able to have conversations with people. And <laughs> he's not a hopeless introvert. So, yeah, I guess, you know, this should be OK. But uh, nevertheless, it was like two years. So first sales job, I'm not even talking to MLM, you know, first sales job, you know, it was two years of bologna sandwiches and ramen soup and pounding the phone and mm -hmm. and and, you know, and, and door slammed in your face and all of that stuff. Um, what were and you selling? I was selling um, components that factories use in automation, sensors and networks and cables and things like that, which is actually a pretty interesting little field. Um, and uh, and I went a long way in that field, but I, but I didn't start to go anywhere until I actually discovered marketing. Um, uh, you know, the people I worked for, they were great salespeople. They didn't have any idea how to teach me how, like, what they knew. Mm -hmm. I think they kind of, a lot of people, they, they learn what they know just kind of by trial and error, and they find something that works for them, and it doesn't mean that they can explain to the next person why it doesn't work mm -hmm. for them. Um, it was the marketers who finally succeeded in explaining to me why people buy, how you sell, how you put a sales message together, what it needs to consist of. And, you know, I'm I'm kind of an eccentric bird, okay? I, I really am. And, you know, the standard sales book just didn't seem to do it for me. But, but when I finally understood marketing, then it started to click and I started to generate leads and 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 I became a consultative sales guy. So once things, uh, you know, changed jobs and changed some things around, uh, it was the customers chasing me. It wasn't me chasing the customers. And now when they asked me in, I was perceived as an expert. There wasn't that much of me to go around. I wasn't going to go see just anybody. Um, and then all of a sudden, it, it just changed the whole dynamic of everything. So and, when did and you then it started. go ahead? When did you discover marketing? Um, or, it was was there a mentor that you had, or yeah? Well, I, I went I went to one of these you know success seminars like they have in the, the in the big cities, uh, Peter Lowe seminar, and Dan Kennedy had the last spot, and his 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 spot attracted my attention. Even like on the postcard that I got, you know, in the mail about the whole thing, it was like, you know, this guy's going to talk yet about about how to replace cold calling with right. results accountable advertising and I had actually been making these you know these these blind stabbing attempts at advertising um, but I had no idea what I, I was doing I mean just no idea what were you doing what were the blind stabbing attempts early on what did that look well, like when one thing that I did come up with, and I, I have to give myself some credit for it, I came up with some kind of, I think it was a cheat sheet of some sort um, for uh, for people that wanted to install a certain kind of network in, in their facility. And I, I, I sent out a postcard, and I think I only like had a list of like 25 companies to send it to, but I think I got like two or three replies. Well, pretty good. That's actually yeah. pretty good, yeah. right? 
but but you know I didn't know what to do next and I didn't you know I didn't know and and all of a sudden I discovered there's this whole little universe that was called direct marketing and it's like the the sky mall catalog in the airplane and it's the infomercials and it's the mail order guys and guess what okay hello salesmen they sell without chasing people around right Oh, oh, and also another another little thing. I remember this is probably twenty years ago. Um, we sent out a Christmas a family Christmas letter, and one of my friends goes, "Perry, that was a great Christmas letter. You're in the wrong job." And uh, you know, and and it only took ten milliseconds for me to think, "Well, you can't make money any money as a writer, but thanks for the compliment." Right? Like writers don't make any money. I don't know what you would ever do with that. Um, I'm an engineer, right? And you know, and you go on, but but I am talking about it 20 years later, right? It, it stuck. You know, somebody tells you something like that that makes you feel good, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, I found out if you like to write, there is a place where you can hang your hat, and it's called direct marketing, and you can write instead of pound the phone. Guess what? Woo! You know, and all of a sudden my life changed, right? It's like, okay, I can write instead of pick up the phone and they can chase me instead of me chasing them. Let's see. Would I enjoy that, right? And then I can spend my time solving their problem instead of convincing them that I know how to solve their problem. And then it's life is just a completely different game uh, after that. So Perry, what did you do in the when you helped the tech company grow? You were in sales, and obviously you were starting to make yourself as the the expert. What were some of the things you did to help the company grow from two hundred to to four million? Well, so um, you know, this was before there was any significant marketing education. Um, other than things like how to build a web page. Okay, this is when the world was in the Here's how you build a web page, you know, phase. Uh, well, I, I, I realized that all the stuff I was learning about direct mail pretty much applied to web pages, that it, it was almost an identical thing. Uh, and, and that a website was more like a letter than it was like a TV show. Uh, now, that's kind of changed a little bit, but right. that's how it was then, right? Um, and, uh, and, the, the first thing, we, and I can't take credit for this one, my boss kind of accidentally did this before I came. Um, so all these customers would call up and we sold basically eight different network technologies and people had to figure out which one would work for them and it was very confusing. He made this chart and it, like, it kind of laid it all out and it helped you narrow it eight down to probably two. Uh, you know, and then they would call you and then they would talk to you about it and then they would buy something. And he made this chart and the chart went viral in 1997. Uh, the trade magazines published it. All these sites started linking to it. All these people started to come to our sites. And, he, and th that already existed the day that I got there. And what I started doing with some help with some other people, like a friend of mine, mine named John Fox, who's a kind of a well-known consultant, um, we were like, okay, so this worked a little. We are going to take this and we are just going to like get, it's going to be everywhere. You know, we, we made these little cardboard slide charts that we handed out at trade shows. And, and it wasn't so much about slide charts or something. It was about the fact that we, we understood that if we published the best editorial information that you could get on the topic, whether it was magazines or trade shows or other manufacturers or whatever, if we had the best, clearest explanation of how you solve the problem of anybody, the world would find us and distributors would call us and reps would want to sell our stuff in their territories and, and other manufacturers would uh, want their salespeople to sell our stuff too because it just helped everything along. And then we're, we're doing, you know, the 20 years ago version of search engine optimization, which was obviously way easier than it is now. Um, and, 
and and we did publicity. Um, we, we, so when you take everything that I just said, and then you go out, you go to magazine editors, you go to trade journals or bloggers or whoever, and you say, hey, I've got something you can put in front of your audience and look, it's readable, it's easy to understand, it's, it, it, makes, it makes learning this stuff fun, uh, they became our friends. And so all of this just kind of came together and with, you know, and everybody, you know, they're calling us instead of us chasing them. And we've got sales reps that are out, you know, feet on the street. The company grew very fast and, and it was a success story. And it was, you know, and I have to say everything before that, like, you know, the bologna sandwiches and ramen soup. I mean, it was miserable. It was hard, you know, and like it's not only is it hard, like people really get scarred up from it. They, they get so weary of just being the pariah, right? And nobody wants to talk to you. And, you know, and when you're, when you know that nobody wants to talk to you, it changes your demeanor and you start acting like a person that nobody would ever want to talk to. And it just, it's just vicious circle, right? Yeah. Were you, you scarred know, up from that at one point or no? Oh yeah, I was. I, when, I, when I got that job, and all of a sudden, I didn't have to pound the phone. People are calling me. First of all, the, the first six months of that job felt like therapy, you know, <laughs> you know, and uh, and then it, it, it took it took a long time for my confidence to, you know, really start to happen. And, you know, and I think everybody's on a journey of figuring out, OK, who am I? What am I really good at? What are my gifts? Mm -hmm. What is the real contribution that I make? What's the difference between all these people that I admire and I'm trying to emulate versus what happens when I take all they do and internalize it and make it my own and I'm not being them anymore, I'm being me. Right. And everybody who learns anything does that. Yeah. And if, if, if you want proof of that, just go to a music store. You've got the Jimi Hendrix guitar and you've got the the Buddy Rich drumsticks and the, right. all the posters of, you know, and when, you know, look, when, when the guy picks up the guitar, he's like, I'm Eddie Van Halen. Right. And he's going to sit there and he's going to try to be Eddie Van Halen. And that's fine. But eventually he has to be him. Right. He's not going to be Eddie Van Halen. He, you're going to be yourself. Yeah. What, what drove you then? When you were in a rut, what drove you then? And I want to know what drives you now that you're not eating bologna sandwiches. <laughs> that's, that's a great question. Well, Honestly, um, a lot of what drove me at first was realizing that as people get older, they oftentimes get railroaded and stuck in careers that they hate. And they like have some job that they're in just because it's got good health insurance. Mm -hmm. And they wake up every morning and they're miserable and they dread going to work. And, you know, I always like the police song that goes... Uh, let's see, every single meeting with his so-called superior is a humiliating kick in the crotch, you know? Um, and I'm like, I am not going to get stuck in that. I, what made some, you see I, that? Because some people don't even realize that they're just living it. Well, I got it in Amway. I got it really early, okay, when I was probably 21. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I... Because because they talk about this. Were your right? parents uh, entrepreneurs or business people, or what did they? Not even not even slightly. Uh, my my dad was a minister. Uh, I don't think he had. He grew up on a farm, and other than having the notion of growing something and selling it at the market, he didn't really have a entrepreneurial bone in his body. Uh, my wife, or sorry, my mom was like a housewife. Uh, you know, and she, you know, so no, like, um, so did you have but, to wake up at like five in the morning and help your dad? Is well, that he wasn't work ever. Ethic? Oh, okay. He, he had, to, he had to do that for his dad. Okay. Um, I, I, you know, I got my work ethic from engineering school, uh, electrical engineering, uh, for anybody that it's might tough. not. Yes. Is Anyone who has to take physics, any physics related subject is in for it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah, I, I learned an eth uh, work ethic in engineering school. But, you know, I, I went to a couple of Amway rallies. And even though, you know, that whole that whole period of my life is kind of a, 
you know, kind of a dark spot because, I mean, I think there was a lot of pink Kool-Aid that I was drinking, but, <laughs> but, um, there, there was some really good things. And, and one of them was, guess what? You know, there are professions that pay a lot of money. And I remember sitting in, in college in, in, in an engineering class and I was watching this kid at the desk next to me and he wrote, dollar sign, $32,000, which obviously was like some job offer that he just got. And, he, you know, he's writing it like, man, can you believe it? This is a lot of money. And I thought to myself, you know, six months ago, I would have thought that's a lot of money. But what I actually know now is that when he buys his house and he gets his wife and he has his baby, he's going to be broke. And that's not a lot of money. Right. Um, and I don't, you know, and it, it wasn't really about having lots of money. It was about having choices. It was about waking up in the morning and doing what I think is important, not what somebody else thinks is important. Yeah. So it was that thought that you don't want to be stuck in something you didn't like day to day. And so what drives you now? Well, okay. So uh, I, I have a lot more freedom than I used to have. Uh, I don't have as much as I want to have. And I think you and I and everybody, we're, we're always train, trying to get better. But you know, one of the things that I realized when I, I got to a certain level of success, like all of a sudden we had the Christmas where we could pretty much get whatever, you know, you wanted to get for Christmas and the bills are paid and there's extra money and you, you can travel and go do, you know, mm -hmm. oh, wow, I can travel. I can go places. So, you know, I go to, I go to Africa, for example, you know, and it's like, you know, guess what, Perry, just cause you got what you wanted in your life doesn't mean that there aren't a, like a whole lot of other people um who you know don't have what they want and in fact I i'll tell you a story that really um shifted my thinking a lot um so first of all uh my wife and i went to Bra before we really had any money we we finagled a trip to brazil to to see her brother who was living there at the time and i really saw i uh, i took a a tour of the slums of sao paulo Okay, they're called the favelas. Now that was gritty. Okay, that was way edgier. Than what did you see? Oh uh, well, well just a week a picture. I, I, uh, I, I met a kid paralyzed from the waist down, living in a concrete hut from a gunshot wound from a from a gang warfare. I saw I saw people uh, living on like you know fifty or a hundred dollars a month, um, spending their life watching TV, being in a gang. I, I saw I saw five year old kids that are members of gangs and they're great gang members because they don't know enough to narc if they get caught by the police. Um, I saw homeless kids living on the street, sleeping in alleys. Wow. Okay, and there's a half a million of them there. By it's horrible, me. yeah. Okay, I saw this stuff, and I, and, and my wife and I, we decided every you know every year or two, if if we ever get to af to be able to afford it, we're gonna go to a place like this, so we don't lose touch with reality. Yeah, like my lattes do follow me. So I took my kids. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, what did your kids say? When they went, <laughs> um, <laughs> I took. I Don't ever take me back, Dad. Or what? No, well, my my daughter, who was I think she was sixteen. I, I took took her on the tour of of the brothels in Calcutta because this lady who who helps women get out of the sex trade took oh. took us on the walk. And we get back to our hotel. I'm room. taking notes. Wait. I have two daughters, so if this is helpful in any way, well, this with... works. Okay. This works. Go ahead. Okay. Look, my I mean, my kids are, you know, spoiled like any anybody's kids, right? And 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 so we we come back to the hotel and she goes, So dad, you know that thing you like to say, half your battles were won for you before you were ever born? And I go, Yeah. She goes, I get it now. Can we leave? <laughs> well, we're not going to leave yet. There's tomorrow. But, you know, um, and like it really did give them a perspective. And now when like when in the house, when we talk about first world problems, like they know exactly right. what that means. They know what third problem, third world problems are. In fact, she went home and she convinced her class at school to sponsor some kids. Wow. Um, so, so, yeah, like 
Um, so, you know, and there's a lot of things wrong with the world. Yeah. And I think, I think, um, I, I think if your if your head is screwed on straight, you you naturally start to move yourself in that direction. I, yeah. uh, some uh, a thought that came up when when you sent in the questions before the interview, I, I thought of two two clients. One client is a guy who in the last 10 years has 10x his income, and he's gone from bologna sandwiches and ramen soup you know, to taking six week vacations in Europe and, and stuff like that. And he's got a really great business and he's kind of miserable. Hmm. And I, and I think the, and he doesn't know why. And I, I think the reason why is he hasn't really figured out what his cause his big is why that he wants to pursue in the world. Yeah. Because what anybody will tell you who becomes financially successful is they got rid of an irritation and they got rid of a major irritation and that's great but it doesn't really scratch the itch yeah you'll and you'll you'll hear this everywhere yeah. okay you, if you're paying attention and and i think i think something that gets a lot closer to scratching the itch yeah. um is uh is is doing things that are way beyond yourself and yeah. and i think that it makes time it makes time disappear when you, yeah. when you're, you know, in that zone. Yeah, that story, Perry, and thanks for sharing that. Makes me think of two questions. One is the obvious. Well, how did he 10x his business? Number two goes back to what you were saying: is why did you even go on that tour? You know, that is unique in itself. Like when you were in Brazil when you first oh. went, why did you even go? Well, I mean, I you, know, you know, people will be like, oh, I don't want to go to a dangerous area. I'm, scared or whatever what made you decide to do that well you know i i have a, i have a basic gut level convic conviction that it, it's part of our job to do that okay mm -hmm. so uh you know J jesus is famous for saying it's it's harder for a rich man to go to heaven than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle he, he's not saying that rich people can't be good people that's not what he's saying but what he, what I think he is saying, and it, and it, and I think this, I think he's saying of he's making a very multi-dimensional statement that has lots of dimensions of wisdom to it, that that, that applies to marketers, and I'll apply this to marketers in a, in a second, okay? But he, what he's saying is that the natural human tendency is to move into your little ivory tower. And cut yourself off from all the other things going on in the world, and customize your environment, and listen to your forty thousand dollars stereo, okay, you know, and and live in a gated community, okay. And I mean, it's the most natural thing in the world to just gravitate towards that, okay. Right. It's 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 my conviction that we always have to resist that. And it's not that it's wrong to have the forty thousand dollar stereo. It's a great investment because look, I spent less than ten because I built it myself, and like it's energy, right? It's inspiration. You know, mm -hmm. I could buy a new CD and it could set my mind on fire, and it makes everything I do better. It makes me a better entrepreneur. It makes me more creative. Okay, whatever fuels the fire, that's great. Okay, but you know what? I'm not going to lock myself into this little world, okay? Um, we, we, we adopted a little girl from China two and a half years ago, and wow. it's been awesome. But, you know, anybody adopted that's Adopted meaning they actually came to the U.S. to your house? Adopted? Well, yeah, like we, oh, went, okay. we flew to China and wow. we adopted her and Amazing. we brought her here. And I know sometimes people do like remote adoption where they'll pay for whatever. Oh, but you actually? Oh no, not like sponsored. No, like we actually adopted. Oh, wow. And, and and we're working on another one, so that'll be two adopted kids and four natural born kids. And like Laura's passion, like her number one passion is adoption, and she's on the adoption blogs and she's involved wow. in this whole community and she does this kind of, you know, so, you know, um, but, but, but th there, there's also, so like, I, I believe your life is just richer when you do that, but, but there's another thing and here's what it is, is that, is that if you 
if you are in any kind of if you're in any kind of information marketer or consultant or or if you do things like what I do or like what you yourself do um your red hot zone of connecting with your customers is when you're still in the game and you're still in the fight and you are still rocky, you know, duking it out, you know, and you might win and you might lose. And that's, that is the spot where you can make the best connection with your customer. Okay. When it's 10 years later mm -hmm. and you've made, you know, five or 10 times more than the average income for a long time and you're, you don't have all this angst and your wife is not about to divorce you because you're broke and you're changing all these, you, you know, uh, you're chasing all these business opportunities and, you know, like, and you're, you're not, it, it, it can be really easy for you to be in an ivory tower and no longer emotionally connect. Yeah. To your customer and I know people they even they become resentful of their customers and they start thinking of them as marks and they thinking of them as walking ATM machines that are stupid enough to buy whatever I put out like and there there really is a mentality out there among some people who teach business stuff and that's like how they are and I yeah. it's really scary like because the people that is scary yeah. people, People who are struggling to make a business work are in such pain, okay? And there's so many people clamoring for their attention, and half of them send them in a battle armed with plastic swords and helmets, and it's just scary. Like, we, it, I, it is a crime to exploit an entrepreneur. Yeah, it is. It is. It, and it's one of the worst things that you can exploit. I mean, there's a lot of other ways to, you can go waste people's money or, or be useless, but that's one of the worst because, you know, entrepreneurs are the lifeblood. They are the ones that create the jobs. They are the ones that make it happen. They are, yeah. they are the ones. I, I, oh, I got I to gotta tell you my Africa story because I never yeah. actually finished it, okay? So it was like 10 years ago, and I, I go and, and I meet this guy, and he... Um, he runs a foster care program for AIDS orphans wow. in Nairobi, okay? And what you got to understand is, I don't know what the stat is now, but the stat was then 6,000 people a day were dying of AIDS in Africa. Wow. And everybody that you meet in Africa has lost at least one extended family member from AIDS, okay? Yeah. So I'll have to send you, I did an interview with someone, and I interviewed them, both their parents, they're from Africa, both their parents died of HIV. Um, <laughs> they had to take care of, I, I don't even remember, nine brothers and sisters, and they actually, no education, no shoes, told the story of them, you know, 18, getting on a flight, and they thought, like, God ascended because someone came with water to them sitting in their airplane seat where they had to, you know, walk two miles to a well and they got into Berkeley and anyways, I'll send it to you. It's, it's phenomenal, wow. but, but exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And so we, I spent like a day and a half meeting these AIDS orphans and it was really depressing. And I had this nagging thought and I finally said to the guy, I said, you know, charity is good and it's good to help these people, but like, what about entrepreneurship? I said, have you ever heard of microloans? And he goes, oh yeah, we do those too. You want to see those people? And I'm like, sure. And he, he takes me around and I meet a couple people. And one of them is this guy named Paul and he's a cobbler. He fixes shoes and he's crippled. So we, we, we're going in this village and we go into his shop and he's sitting against the wall with his crutches leaning against the wall. He's fixing shoes. There's a line of people waiting to get served and, and I'm talking to him through the translator and this guy, there's something different about this guy. And the difference was most people that I met in Africa, they were very polite, they were very nice, very friendly, but they just had this glazed like burned out look in their eyes and he didn't have that look he, he kind of had a sparkle in his eye and he's looking back at me and he's talking to me and you know his kids have uniforms for school and they have their books and they're going to school and they're all fed and everything's okay 
Uh, and he did all this on a hundred dollar microloan is what wow, got all this that's started. That's amazing. And, and all of a sudden, while I'm talking to him, I have this flashback. And all of a sudden, my mind takes me. I'm remembering I'm in some Amway seminar and we're like spraying sweet shot in the air and we're going to be millionaires and we're going to be diamonds and 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 like and I thought about how ridiculous that now seemed like now that I've kind of grown up and become a real entrepreneur and have a real business and 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 all of a sudden See, here's what the epiphany was. The epiphany was, well, you wanted to be an entrepreneur, and that's why you were standing on the chair, and that's why you were jumping up and down and getting all excited, and now you're an entrepreneur. And so is he. And dropping food out of airplanes doesn't solve the problem. And sending missionaries over to feed the poor kids doesn't solve the problem. It's good. It's helpful, but it doesn't solve the problem. You know what solves the problem? Is Paul starting a cobbler shop. Empowering them. On a hundred bucks. Yeah. That solves the problem. And you get a bunch of him, and then Africa's not poor anymore. And it's and so it's like and this is all like going on in my head in about ten seconds, right? And it's like Hey, wait a minute, Perry. So, okay, so you teach Google AdWords and you teach direct response marketing and you teach people how to get these little businesses off the ground. You know, Perry, maybe what you do is actually really, really important. And ever since that trip to Nairobi, which I wouldn't have taken if Laura and I hadn't decided we're going to go on trips like this, mm -hmm. I suddenly realized, you know, even even the stuff I do every day of teaching marketing is really important. I am I am saving the world. I don't have to be a monk or right. a missionary or a or a Peace Corps volunteer. I can do this. Mm -hmm. But you know what? I'm also going to take those trips. In fact, I'm going to be in India two months from now because you know back in the experience because there's people I can help and there's stuff mm -hmm. I can see. And every time I come home from a trip like that, my brain is bulging with all this experience that I just had. It makes me richer and sharper and more aware. And you know, I, I think everybody should do that. Like you know, it, it'll you won't you won't be sleepwalking through life if you're doing stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. And for people, you can even do that at your local city. I'm sure there's you know homeless shelters or whatever. You know, so someone. Well, I do that too. Yeah, but. <laughs> But, you know, uh, but in, yes, wherever you can right. do it. Yes. Yes. So my question is this, and, and um, this is a loaded question, but for someone who's at that bologna sandwich stage, how do they get from there to 10xing their business like that person? And then maybe how do they find their big why? You know, like that person you know, who you said is miserable, even after 10 in their business, you know, someone may be at the baloney stage right now and be like, Perry, I don't care about going to India. I need to feed, you know, mm -hmm. to eat. What are yes. some of the, the good tactics that arms them with that sword, not the plastic one, but the metal one that will help them? Well, okay. So I, I think a big, 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 big piece of any kind of success is there needs to be a lot of elimination. Okay. Okay. And that that's why I wrote the 80 20 yes. book. I'm glad you're bringing that up because I have a number um, of questions which I'm not going to get to, but I want you to talk about your 80 20 sales and marketing book. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, the, I, the, there's a Google book, there's a Facebook advertising book, and, and those are, I mean, if if you're going to do either of those kinds of advertising, then, then you need that. But the 80 20 book is the first thing that I ever had the opportunity to put out that could be for almost anybody. It could be for one of my friends that I, you know, go to the bar with who, yeah. you know, wants to start some kind of business or something, right? Or a sales guy. And and it, what it really is, I mean, you call it 80-20 sales and marketing, and it really is about 80-20, uh, of course, but it's really my manifesto on how, how sales should be done. And it's really, it's the book I wish I'd had 20 years ago. Um, and, and like, 
you know, so like 80% of, the, uh, of any list of choices anybody puts in front of you, you shouldn't take. Okay, and really only 5% are really truly going to hit pay dirt the way that you want them to. And so how do you eliminate, okay, you know, it's like, well, you know what's wrong with MLM? Nobody has a USP. And USP is the most important thing in marketing. So MLM, not a good business. And for people who don't know, it's unique selling proposition. Yes. Unique selling proposition, yeah. right? It's like, okay, if, if you don't have a unique selling proposition, you're not in a good business. Yeah. So eliminate everything that's not a USP. Well, that's going to save somebody like yeah. five years. Yeah. Okay. Now, what else can we eliminate? And it just goes chapter by chapter by chapter. Now, let, let me give you another book that I think you'll probably think is kind of an odd choice. Okay. Um, the Star Principle by Richard Koch. Now, Richard has become a friend of mine. He wrote the original 8020 book, yeah. which set my mind on fire. It was like this huge, uh, and I, I actually saw things in 8020 um, that Richard himself hadn't really completely latched onto, and that kind of set me on my own trajectory. But, but the reason why the star principle, the star principle is about eliminating opportunities mm -hmm. that are not going to pay off. Yeah. We all need that. Yes. We, you know, especially entrepreneurs following shiny objects. I'm, you know, guilty of that for sure. And, and in fact, if you go to starprinciple.com, it's a site that I created where you can judge opportunities based on, it'll give you a score hmm. of how likely they are to go supernova. Um, the, the score goes from one to 200 and anything over 100 is what we call a star business or a star opportunity. Like, yes, this actually probably will do really well. And the, the typical business will only get like a 30 or a 40 when you take the test. And, and, and so like you should eliminate stuff that doesn't work. And, and, and I actually have to explain where this comes from. The star principle and the criteria that are on that little quiz are the, are the criteria that Richard uses to vet opportunities that he looks at as a private equity investor. Mm -hmm. So in 23 years, he grew his wealth from 4 million to $230 million. He's worth a quarter of a billion dollars. Wow. And he did it by investing in 16 companies and eight of them went supernova. 50% wow. batting average. Okay, now that's almost unheard of. Yeah, really. Venture capitalists are happy to bat 10%. And he wow. bats 50%. How does he do it? Star principle. So, so like if, if you can eliminate stuff that's not going to work and if you can calm yourself down, like I, I had this mantra when I was, uh, when I was in MLM and the mantra was massive action solves every problem. Completely wrong. Massive disqualification solves the problems that actually deserve to be solved. That's the truth. Mm -hmm. Okay. Most problems do not deserve. And then to be massive solved. action after, after you eliminate disqualify. Yes. 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 And then after you narrow it down and you get it, it's like, okay, this is really vital. This is really vital. This is, then you go massive action. And yes, mm -hmm. there's going to be a period in your career where you're going to need to work 18 hours a day for some period of time. Uh, it's a period of time that, uh, that, that Dan Kennedy calls the phenomenon. And it's when everything comes together and all of a sudden it's firing on all the sil cylinders and all, it's all working and you accomplish more in a year than you did in the last 10. Okay, that's the 18 hours a day, okay? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And by the way, 18 hours a day is okay for a while, but don't do it seven days a week, do it six days a week and take one day off. Take, you know, Take a lesson from the Jewish people. They, they're religious about the Sabbath, not just because it's religion, it's smart. You need to recharge. You need to not burn out. You need to not be divorced. You need to still have a family. Uh, all of that stuff actually yeah. fuels your business. It doesn't take away from your business. Um, and I'm really adamant about that. Yeah. You should not be working seven days a week. In fact, one day a week you should shut down 
and you're not on the computer and you're not answering emails and you're not in your inbox and you're not having your chain jerked and, and you, you need to enjoy it and yeah. you need to relax. And I have a question in here about your daily rituals because you do so much and I, I did read somewhere you had five kids, a wife and all that. How do you manage it all? But um, go back to for a second. So elimination is one. What's another thing that someone should be armed with on the battlefield that will help them? Um, well, you know, I start, I take the first hour of my day every day. I usually get up around six-ish. And first hour, the house is quiet. Nobody's doing anything. And everybody I'm surprised else is... your house is ever quiet with five kids. Well, it's noisy until about midnight. I'll tell you that, you know. Um, but uh, I do what's uh, sometimes called free writing. There's, there's this book called The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. And it's basically you sit down with a notebook and go. And it's like, and it's not, we're not copywriting and it's not really a diary. It's like, whatever comes into your mind, write it down. I use it as a form of prayer and meditation. I use it to like open my creative channel and I, and I use it to solve problems. When there's stuff I'm stuck on, when there's things I'm upset about, when there's puzzles I'm trying to solve, it's like, I'll write out the question and then I'll let the answer come. And you know, it's just this this flow. And you know, I, I do it for an hour. I know that's a lot. I've orchestrated a lot of things to in order to be able to make that happen. Maybe you could only do it for 10 yeah. minutes, but you know, I think one of the most important things you ever do is you develop the ability to listen to yourself and listen to your intuition and shut the editor off. Yeah, it's hard and to do. Let the flow happen. It's yeah. hard to do, and everybody's educated and inculcated against doing that. And everybody lives in this coulda, woulda, shoulda, and you ought to do this, and you ought to do it that way. And there's all these rules. And if you have this space that you carve out where there are no rules and whatever, uh, I'm telling you, it's really productive. And I've, I've, I've solved some really thorny problems just by letting that flow happen and not overthinking stuff. Yeah. So when you had that epiphany about the 80-20 and then you went on to write the book, what did you go back and do in your business because you had this, this shot or epiphany after you know, discovering, you know, it all came together. You knew the 80-20, but it all kind of came together. Kind of like your daughter, it, he, she realized what you were saying. It just came, the light bulb went on. What did you go back and do in your business? Well, so 80-20, see, most people think they understand 80-20. And I'll guarantee you that 90% of them don't really understand it at all, okay? Because what they think it is, so, you know, 80, 20 well, says understanding and implementing are also different, right? Even if, well, we, yeah, yes. Yeah, sure. Sure. Um, so, you know, i most people know that 80% of your business comes from 20% of your customers and all, you know, a lot of people, they sort of know that, but they only know it like looking in the rear view mirror. Okay. And, but what 80, 20 really is, is, is 80, 20, it's an infinite repeating pattern. Where there's an inside every 80-20, there's another one and another one and another one and another one. Okay, and it's more like a set of lenses. It's like once you get it, like once you really get it, then all of a sudden you can't even look out the window without seeing 80-20. Okay, mm -hmm. I am looking out my window and there's the tree. Well, what's the 80-20 of a tree? Well, it's 80% of the sap goes through 20% of the branches. And not only that, 80% of the 80% of the sap goes for through 20% of 20% of the branches and on and on it goes. And I could look at the street and there's an 80-20 about the street and there's an 80-20 with the rooms in my house and there's an 80-20 with how I spend my time. And when you start taking those, you know, 80-20 to the power of three and then sticking them together, you get these giant, super powerful leverage points where... You, you focus all your effort on 1% of your business and you get a breakthrough. Yeah. Okay. So how do you get that? How do you get someone listening right now to have that epiphany like you did? 
Okay, the only way I know how to do it is you need to immerse yourself in a deep exploration until it finally, like, happens for you, okay? And and it, it's why I wrote the 80-20 book, and, and it's my real goal when people buy that book and they read it. And I can tell from the Amazon reviews that some people get it and some people don't. You can read the Amazon reviews and you'll see which ones got it and which ones don't. Mm -hmm. The ones that got it, they're like, oh my word, this is amazing. Like, this is everywhere. I can apply this to everything. It's like, there's almost not any decision where I can't, like, bring this to bear. And other people are like, oh, it's just that old Pareto thing all over again. It's like, no, dude, like, you didn't get it. You didn't get it. Well, it's okay. I mean, it's not for everybody. Yeah. I mean, it applies to everybody, but it doesn't mean everybody should figure it out. You know, but like, like immerse yourself and like read the whole thing, you know, all the way to the appendix, uh, including the appendix, like just like the whole thing. And, you know, I, I imagine you'll know, but, you yeah. know, you get halfway and it's just dreadful and forget it. But you know, I think <laughs> a lot of people are like, but but like give, give it a serious chance and and there's a tool that goes with the book there uh, 8020curve.com and you can you can take data that you collect in your business and you can stick it in there and you can make predictions if you can if you can really wrap your head around this you will never think about business or really anything the same way so what did you do in your business because i remember watching a video of you giving a talk and it really was interesting what you were saying. You know, like you were saying, you kind of can 80-20 it to the nth degree. And you were saying how if you're leaving money on the table because you can't, there's people, a percent, like a small percent that will buy a $5,000 product. And there's, there's another percent that will buy a $3,000 product. What did you go back and do in your business when you had this realization? Well, the first and most obvious thing was all of a sudden realizing that that, that people's capacity to buy and consume is on this huge spectrum that was way bigger than I ever realized, okay? And so it kind of works like this. If there's a thousand people that give you 10 bucks, then there's a hundred people that give you a hundred, and there's 10 that would give you a thousand, and there's one that would give you 10,000. Right. Um, and and most people would never realize that when they sell the ten dollar product, that they're that that one of those one of those customers standing right there in front of you is already a thousand dollar customer. They already want to spend a thousand dollars to scratch that itch. They right. have the money. It's burning a hole in their pocket, and they will spend it somewhere. And they're and they will do it to scratch the same itch. They don't even need a different niche and you don't need a new customer. And so it was about realizing how much value is stored just in the customers I already have mm -hmm. and seeing that this pattern exists in pretty much every little thing that I go look at, you know, and then you start adding more products and more markets and more audiences and stuff. It just all multiplies mm -hmm. and I had just, so I just never really understood that. And so now almost everything we do, we engineer both, you know, if we start with a high-end thing, we engineer a low-end version. If we start with a low-end version, we end engineering a high-end because we want to at least like mop up uh, th that money that's just yeah. sitting there waiting to be spent. Yeah. Well, Perry, I have about 50 questions, but I'm going to, I'm going to limit it. Um, because I know we have limited time, but one of them, one person told me when I asked who should I interview for the legend of copywriting, and you know Brian Kurtz obviously mentioned you, and there were there were multiple people who mentioned you, and one of them said you need to. He may not consider himself a copywriter, but he is one of the best storytellers of all time. So I have to ask you, what are some ways you craft a story to keep people interested? Well, well, the first thing I want to say about that is that. Telling a story is not actually my first natural inbred impulse. And I actually have to override some of my natural tendencies. Mm -hmm. When somebody asks me a question, and now, like your interview is actually a great example. You said, Perry, I want stories. I don't want you to just teach. 
my natural thing that I do, like if you wake me from a deep sleep, is just start is to switch into engineering mode and start teaching you stuff. That is my natural thing. When I tell stories, I actually have to stop and I, I, I have to take my thinking and I have to turn it upside down. Okay? And so um, and so when um, when when I'm I'm presented with a marketing uh, a marketing project, okay. So uh, my mind will go well. The logical thing that they need to do, they need to start with A, and then they go to B, and then they're going to do C, and you know I go through the all this thing, and I have to stop and I go, okay. So I need a story that's going to engage them and get them to C, which is going to get them to B, which is going to get them to A. Mm -hmm. And it's actually completely backwards. Mm -hmm. And then I have to go, what is a story that illustrates this? And then I have to sit and I have to think really hard about it. Okay. And then I have to do the whole thing backwards from the way that I actually think. Okay. So I have to think backwards. There's even a chapter in the 80-20 book that talks about how marketers have to think backwards. Yeah. And, and, and so first, I, the point I want to make is what I do really well is not even the thing that comes most naturally for me. Okay? I have learned to tell stories by studying great storytellers. Um, and by the way, uh, I, I assume Weiss is Jewish. Is that true? Yes. Okay. I mean, it doesn't necessarily so, have to be, but in my case, it is. Yes. Well, all right. Well, look, you know, uh, it's probably politically incorrect to say this, but Jewish people are overwhelmingly, you know, like the 80-20 of disproportionately successful. And one of the reasons is, is the rabbis and the, and, and the, the Midrash and the Torah and all that stuff is all stories. Okay, and they are the best stories in the world because, because from a Darwinian point of view, they out survived all the other stories and they outsold all the better stories. So, like, if you want great stories, go read about David and Goliath and go read about Abraham and go read about Samuel and Daniel and the lion's den. Those are the best stories that there are, and the best thing you can do immerse yourself in is a storytelling culture. Mm -hmm. And I, I was I was fortunate to have grown up in Your that. dad was a minister. My dad was a yeah. minister. Okay. So what's your favorite and, story it, from your dad? The favorite story from my dad. Yeah. Um well uh boy I did I didn't give that any thought. Well <laughs> Okay, so it's top of the stack. First thing that came into my mind is, is, is you know, dad did not make much money, especially when I was younger. And, and my mom's got this story of, of there's no, literally no food in the house. It's all, the cupboards are bare. She goes to the store. She has 18 cents. And the baby is hungry, which is my older sister. So this is before I was born. And there was nothing in the store for, for, for 18 cents. The cheapest thing was a can of beans for 19 cents. And, and she's going, God, please help me. And, and, and the guy marks the beans from 19 cents down to 18 cents. And she buys the beans and she feeds the baby. Okay. And she's like, isn't God so good? He took care of us. Well, yep. Yep. I agree. And... Um, let's just also be aware that's kind of like a poverty story, you know, and I'm like really not trying to live like at that level of, of subsistence for, you know, in, in my life. So like, let's not make this our narrative, but yes, you know, yep. Fed the baby, never went hungry, did okay. Um, you, you know, th there was a lot of that kind of poverty mentality that dad had to deal with. He dealt with people. They, they don't want him. They don't, they don't, they don't think they should pay 
him enough money to feed his family because they feel like it takes money away from somebody else. You know, there's all these little old ladies that wrote checks, you know, um, and well, the little old lady with blue hair wrote us a $10 check. And I, I have this, and it was, it was like you would feel guilty about it. You know what? I have this whole other perspective on giving. Giving is a privilege. I, I don't feel that way. I don't feel, I'm not the little old lady who, who, who wrote the check. Like I, I hope, I hope the people that I'm sending money to are feeding their families. Right. There's a lot of money in the world. There's plenty of money in the world. Like, so yeah. how's that? Is yeah. that a good story? It, it's a great story. I mean, not, not when you think about it, but you know what I mean? <laughs> it's not good for your mom at the time. Um, yeah. It was, it, it was what she. It was the best she could do, and and you know it's good for what it is. Yeah. Right? So, Perry, I have one more question. Then I want you to tell people where they can find more about you. Um, my question goes back to what you're saying about your daily rituals and what makes you productive. Because what I noticed with this process is you're very. You must be a very productive person because you have all these systems in place. Because I don't talk to you or email you until now. You know, you have a team in place that. You know, kind of structures the time yeah. uh, and probably takes things off your plate. So what are some things that other people should be doing to put systems in place to make themselves more productive? Well, so I, so I think that a lot of entrepreneurs uh, are going to struggle with needing systems and not being systems people. And like... This it's is a good gonna point. Sound... It's a good point because you're an engineer, so yeah. Well, yeah, but th this is gonna this is gonna sound strange because because I'm not a systems person in the Michael Gerber E Myth business system sense of the word myself. I'm a systems person in terms of flowcharts and diagrams and theories and models and and, and con concepts and high level stuff. I hate procedures. I hate rules. I, I have actually struggled to build systems in my business and mostly the systems in my business got built because I somehow managed to hire people who are inclined to deal with systems, procedures, rules, methods, flow charts, diagrams, documentation, processes, like stuff that bores me to tears, okay? And and I, I, I'm just seeing this because I think a lot of people listening to this, if you're a good entrepreneur, you might actually have some tendencies that are kind of fatal to having a business that runs like a well-oiled machine. And the, and the symptom is, is, man, we have a great business here, but it's like the crisis du jour. Like there's a crisis all the time, but I'm really smart and I can solve it. So I'm really smart so I can solve it. Like every time something comes up, oh, I'll solve that. Oh, I'll fix that. I'll fix the computer. I'll, you know, I'll negotiate with this crazy person. I'll, I'll calm them down, you know, and you go and like, and that's just a recipe for working 14 hours a day and killing yourself. And so I just want to encourage people that if you are kind of chaotic and if you're an alchemist and you're a creative person and, and, and you do suffer from that shiny object syndrome, well, it's a, it's, it's a reflection of a really powerful set of skills that you have, which is that, you know, you see opportunities and you can solve problems really fast and you can see 16 different ways to solve a problem. And that is great. But you need to find people who are systems people who are not like you and like our tendency is to hire people like ourselves it's why i put the marketing dna test in the in the 80 20 book because you know creative people need producers you know and writers need visual people you know and and emotional people need logical people and the best team is not naturally like a bunch of best friends. Yeah. Um, it, it's often people with very different personalities and very different perspectives who sort out 
among each other what everybody should be doing uh, and, and I want to encourage you you know that that's how you should think about it. yeah and that's really important and again like your staff is amazing and we've gotten a detail of what their per like I, one of your staff we were talking about personalities and I and she said I said what's your personality and I told her mine so I actually it's ingrained in she's um, you know told she's like a melancholy phlegmatic and <laughs> And so we got that detailed in our conversation um, of so I can see how important that per they, they love that personality. Your staff loves that personality type stuff. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we're very aware it. of it. Yes, yes. Um, Perry, I appreciate your time. Tell people where they can find out more. I've had a blast. Uh, where can they find out more about you and what should they check out? What are you working on now? If, if you go to sell8020.com, mm -hmm. uh, you'll find my 8020 book and you can buy it for a penny plus shipping. So it's seven bucks in the US and 14 international. It's cheaper than Amazon and you get a bunch of bonuses that you wouldn't get mm -hmm. on Amazon. And uh, I'm, I'm literally taping dollar bills to this book to send it to you. But you'll see that there's a reason and there's a rationale and there's a process that if you're really smart, you'll study what I do. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll study what happens next after you buy that book yes. and you'll take notes. Take notes just on um, watching the video of what you yeah. what you say. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 the book will change your life. And you know, and if you're if you if you're so inclined, I, I think you can you can have a huge 80-20 epiphany and all of a sudden You'll never see the world the same way again, and you'll eliminate a lot of stuff that would have wasted your time. So. Yeah, yeah, Perry, I appreciate. Well, wow, this is a great, great questions you asked, Jeremy. My this inclination is to keep you on for another hour, but I know you're a busy guy. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I really, have, I, have I really appreciate your time, Perry, and um, maybe I'll see you around Chicago at some point. So, thank you so okay. much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It's great to talk to you today.